why we as gamers should stop buying bad DLC. Hello, you may know me, but more than likely, you do not. You probably never even heard of my channel until now. Either way, I'm Professor Hawk, or rather that's the name of my channel. Now when I'm gaming online or at local tournaments, I'm known as Red Raven. Now I've been playing video games for the majority of my life. My earliest memories were Super Mario on the NES at the age of 5. I'm 28 currently, and I've had an extensive experience in watching the development of video games as a whole. I remember the times back in the golden age, the early days of Sony PlayStation and Nintendo 64, long, long predating the days before the infamous Sony vs Xbox wars. I grew up before DLC was even a thing. Things now compared to the way they used to be. All this progress, phooey! You were born, got in line, and you died. And that's the way it was, and we liked it! The most gamers that grew up in that time can testify that gaming is a completely and drastically different experience than it's ever been. I'm here to give my reason, yes, my opinion, as to why we as gamers should discontinue the practice of supporting bad DLC. Unless it's download content that we've exclusively asked for, I can't understand how and why we let it get so bad. Now I was gonna initially title the video 10 Reasons Why, but I've come to understand it's a little clickbaity and it's not really my type of thing. I'll be presenting content from other YouTubers in this video as well as providing a link to the specified video I'm quoting and or agreeing with. I also like to explore other perspectives distinctive from my own to further understand. The purpose of this video is to highlight the changes because of DLC in the gaming industry. Some changes that most people may not even be aware of. It's somewhat of a curse that seems almost impossible to break. But I believe it's our responsibility as gamers and also consumers to take back our power. Because without us, how can these gaming practices grow and continue to thrive if we refuse to support its current state of affairs? If there are so many of us out there that disagree with this practice, why is it so prevalent and widespread in all facets of gaming today? We're talking about fully monetizing games to their full potential. Seriously, fuck DLCs. Is online DLC actually killing gaming? I am going to steal his card to buy V-Bucks, guys. DLC, expansions, season passes as well, so that is that is technically a digital sale, and uh, microtransactions. Stop buying season passes. <laughs> the the standards that we, we like I, I'm yeah. used to. What the, what the hell are you? No! 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 What is day one DLC? Oh man, Dead Space 3 looks so freaking awesome. I mean, combine resources with real world money. Yeah, I'm gonna pass on this one. Oh hell yes, a new Forza game on a brand new Xbox? I can't wait to see all the new cars they added. These cars you gotta buy with real money? No thank you. Black Ops 3? I mean, I guess it looks- Oh my god! Now if you've been playing consoles for any length of time for over a year, I'm more than certain you've heard this term at least once. Now, if you watch a lot of YouTube videos that review games, I'm sure you've heard it countless times more. But how can you justify locking a fully developed portion of a video game the day it's released after paying full price for said video game? So let me get this straight. You want me to pay $60 plus tax for, let's just say a fighting game that has 20 playable characters. I play a few rounds after popping the disc in, I come to find out there are four more characters roughly priced at $5 each. Now if my math is correct, that will make the complete game over $80. Notice I didn't say hypothetically anywhere in that statement because I'm sure this has happened or something akin to it several times within and also beyond the fighting game genre. Maybe if the actual cost of the game was $80, it probably wouldn't sell as good or as fast. Something like that could be a real issue for a company which thrives on consumers to purchase their product. Now remember, there's always another way to look at it. What if hypothetically day one DLC was more of a reward to hardcore fans or anyone, anyone else who purchased the game the day it was released or even a week of its release? They could make it available for a limited time and then offer the option to buy it after a season or so. 
I've been reviewing the outcry of how some people feel about the topic of downloadable content. Seriously, fuck DLCs. And there are a lot of different perspectives and viewpoints to consider. But what I see more than anything else is this. People who pay full price for a game who come across a paywall the day it came out, they feel like they've been cheated or taken advantage of. Now, another viewpoint, you know, someone might say is, yeah, you can argue about how you feel, but no one held a gun to your head to make you buy the content. That's another perspective I've heard. Now, while both of these perspectives ring true, you can't, you can't really tell someone how they should feel about a particular experience, nor can you expect someone to agree with how you feel about a particular experience. This is the dividing factor in our community, which stems from only discussions about downloadable content. Is money the problem? Or are we warring with one another about what's right or wrong when it comes to our wallets? But again, how can these com how can these publishing companies justify forcing you to pay for content already on the disc or download after purchasing the game for full, for full price? And the answer is, they cannot. You just can't help but buy it. Sometimes, whether we'd like to admit it or not, we're the problem. And nothing will change until we do. What the gives her love? Why is there DLC in single player games? Now there are some games that are held as must plays. Some of these games were once held as the greatest games ever made, had a huge following, and even had people who live and breathe the content from those games. Games like Legend of Zelda, GoldenEye, Crash Bandicoot 1, 2, and Warped, Super Smash Bros, Street Fighter, Tech, and Devil May Cry. The list goes on. But games such as these seem to be fading in memory. You know, the times when we bought a disc or a cartridge and anyone who did had the full game. I'd like to start by harkening back to the days before digital downloads and online patching, during what I like to think of as the golden age of gaming. Do you remember back when the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One were just getting announced a few years before they came out? A bunch of rumors circulated that video games were going to jump from $60 new to $80 new with the next generation, and that didn't happen? It's because market research showed consumer backlash. You and I bitched enough to where they were afraid to do it, and they decided they would find another way to get us instead. And that's how we arrived to here. Now we have games like Batman, Arkham Asylum, Mass Effect 2, Bioshock 2, and Horizon Zero Dawn, just to name a few of the ones out there. Not saying that any of these games are bad, quite the contrary. They're so good. You just want to play through every bit of gameplay, discovering hidden lore, or just extending your playing experience because you love the game so much. And there's nothing wrong with that. But here's the issue. What if they make a game so great and extensive that it just kills just about every other game out there in existence because it's just the best gaming experience of all time? Shark card microtransaction. GTA 5 is the prime example of our spending habits when it comes to digital shopping. The game has made $1.4 billion from digital, 78% of which came from add on content. Prime example of how they are monetizing a game years and years after release mm. and making a shared load of money. How does this speak for the future? What's the future going to look like with game? Arguably. Just think about it. It might seem overly exaggerating to even consider. But is it not possible? With ever-expanding games, you know, they have the possibility to grow so large that it can eclipse other gaming experiences because it's just never finished. Some of these games can reel you in for the rest of your life. And single-player DLC? I'm looking at you. DLC can actually cause financial problems for parents. Now, this is a little controversial. Now we know it's not like, it doesn't happen to everybody, but there are countless examples of kids or teenagers or people who don't work getting a hold of their siblings, relatives, parents, credit cards, you know, for online purchases, loot boxes, season passes, and various other forms of downloadable content like V-Bucks and skins and stuff. In my personal opinion, I think this epidemic stems from how impressionable young people are, as well as the fact that kids aren't very nice to one another. You know, how this inadvertently primes young people to buy this content. You know, it can stem from a multiple, multitude of things. But what I'm highlighting is, one, the gambling and addictive RNG loot boxes style and how manipulative they can be as well. Bullying or peer pressure, you know, from kids because their parents probably can't afford to buy their kids that new skin or that new map or whatever. Fear of missing out is a thing, but you know, that's another topic. Now, 
I thought it may be a good idea to explain, but I'd actually rather just show you a few examples of what I mean, especially with the whole you know, Fortnite epidemic. I even think there are countless memes on the subject, you know, don't quote me on that though. If you're not familiar, this is about the story where a 17-year-old boy using his dad's credit card racked up a bill of a cool 8 grand on Xbox DLC. Now, the, where the story really gets interesting is that the dad, rather than hold the son responsible, he holds Microsoft responsible. He believes it's their fault and Microsoft, surprisingly, actually refunded the eight grand. What? We are going to purchase the holy skin tomato head, which, remember, we don't have enough... Dad, could I, um, get some V-Bucks, please? Ah! Wow! Okay, so we're gonna go buy a thousand V-Bucks, which I think that's enough for the tomato guy. Um, yeah, no, it's not. We're gonna have to go $25. Rest in peace. My dad's credit card. Yeah, there we go. This looks great. Uh, I'm playing Fortnite. He's playing matches. Is that my credit card? You have spent 500 pounds on PlayStation. I can't believe you have done this again. You've done this before. Ah, no, 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 no. That? That's my headset. You can't do that to my headset, Mum. Please, Cut no. It up. Cut it up. Take this away. Players are subject to fear of missing out. FOMO. If you haven't realized it, I'm not used to this. I remember when you bought a game and everyone who did as well had pretty much the same experience. Now it's like, if you don't have the money, you don't get the experience. Basically, pretty much, fuck you, pay me type of deals. The video gaming experience of my time seems to be all but forgotten. With the rise of season passes, day one DLC, repacked old content from previous titles that were successful or even critically acclaimed. Yeah, these are the times we're in. I'm basically 30, so yeah, I'm old. Since then, we ha we now have a multitude, a myriad, a plethora of decisions to make when it comes to downloadable content. From skins to maps, from added storylines to loot boxes. This can be considered a good thing, sure, but where does it end? Just because I can't afford to buy $3,000 worth of V-Bucks or Call of, Call of Duty points, why can't I earn the skin or map through leveling up or achieving actual milestones in the game? Because the game makes far more revenue with downloadable content for its publishers and developers. The simple fact that Michael transactions in games rakes it in by the bundles is a good reason to keep it in, right? You can argue it keeps the game and com companies in business, sure. But when does the DLC become so oversaturated, so overpriced, and less and less exciting and exclusive with each new expansion or update? What happens when it becomes so overdone you have to decide which little piece of the game you want to experience? In modern gaming, I've noticed that companies are starting to try and find new ways of dividing out every single piece of content. What if online games tried to do this? What if an online game had the option of buying just the DLC packs individually? What if you could buy just the DLC of Halo 5? You could only play on the maps you enjoyed most, or maybe even just buy only the multiplayer. Say you don't care about what Master Chief's doing and the monsters he's fighting this week. Say you just want to be able to go on online and play with your friends on the maps they enjoy most. Would this be a good thing or a bad thing? The fear of missing out is preyed upon through marketing ploys to manipulate you into buying something that's only offered for a limited time so you kind of have to buy it. You can do whatever you want with your money, but don't be duped into it. Use your brain. Inflation. With the cost of living constantly increasing and the amount of income rapidly declining, why am I being asked to pay $60 for a video game? Not only that, I'm also given the option of being satisfied with what I get for 60 bucks plus tax, or paying more to be cast into the unknown to find out if I like what I bought on top of paying full price after the fact. 
free-to-play games aren't really the focal point of what I'm highlighting and discussing herein, but they are not excluded. How can a free-to-play game continue to be available as free-to-play if its developers can't feed themselves after all the work they've done? I'm honestly not sure, but you don't have to over-inundate any game, free or not, with microtransactions and in-game content that requires real-world currency instead of dedication and mastery, or at the very least the option between the two. While the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, sooner rather than later, if we continue at the rate we're going, video gaming will be a luxury very few of us will be able to enjoy. On interesting titles, innovation stagnation, early aggressive discounting, tumbling stocks, and title fatigue are all reasons that I thought that the next triple A game industry crash was upon us. But I got it wrong. It's actually been going on for the last six months. Look, if video game companies were doing as I'm talking AAA, were doing that great, would they be make putting Fallout 76 50 percent off? Would they have put Battlefront 5, uh, or Battlefield 5, sorry, 50 uh, percent off? No, of course not. If they could get full price, they would do it. You're not going to convince me that. No, everything's doing great. They're just trying to give back to the community. Baloney. If, if if Battlefield 5 was doing great, they wouldn't have put out this last second promotion to all existing uh, old franchise players to get the game at 50% off. They aren't meeting expectations. And a lot of this is because, not because they're not making money, okay? It's because they're not making enough money. It condones shady business practices. The biggest reason why, the main event, the epitome, the epitome and so on and so forth as to why we should stop supporting bad downloadable content. Is anyone familiar with Origin? Yeah, Origin. Origin is basically EA's equivalent of Steam, although it's since become pretty infamous for all the terrible business practices that go down on it. First of all, there was a two-year entitlement clause when the system first launched, meaning that if you didn't use Origin enough in your first two years, it would be deleted and all of your game purchases would be taken away from you. I'm serious. This caused a huge backlash and EA tried to defend themselves by saying that the clause was put in the game by mistake. Yeah, that stuff like that doesn't happen by mistake. Then there was a huge fiasco with people getting their entire Origin accounts banned because they said something lame on the forum. That's right. If you said something naughty or too critical on the EA forum, they wouldn't just ban you from the forum, they would ban your entire Origin account, locking you out of playing any games that you paid your hard-earned money for just because EA didn't like something you said. Something you said. Something you said. This was later changed, so if you get banned, you could still play your games offline, but that does not change the fact that EA is very quick to eliminate your access to things that you already paid for, and Origin is one of the worst places for them to do this. Damn, that's crazy. A lot of this information I wasn't even aware of until I began looking up the various sources and topics for this video. And I must say, I learned a lot. I was shocked in the beginning, but yeah, you kinda get used to it. A lot of this nonsense goes on because they get enough support to continue it. Their shareholders are happy, so I guess they are as well. But what happens when the thunderous outcry of the mistrust gamers and consumers have become so overwhelmingly ear splitting and we actually decide to discontinue supporting AAA gaming companies as a whole. What would they do to try to regain trust? Would they even try? I'm almost eager to find out. But either way, that's probably a far ways off. But look around you. When will you be asked to buy a season pass for a game that comes out three months from now and all of a sudden the game get canceled or they just never fulfill the promise, the pre-order campaign promise you? Even still, I look at some of these digital price tags and say to myself, who the hell would buy that? I log into a game, and then I'm surprised at what I see. Developers are less likely to finish a game to completion because you already paid full price. I mean, I really can't even believe this is a thing. You mean to tell me people are actually paying real world money for unfinished and or incomplete games at full price. Dummy! <laughs> you mean people actually considered this and thought it was okay? <laughs> well, you open the door for a lot of wild twists and turns every time you buy into this. 
don't really know what I'm getting at, then you're probably new on the block. I'm not the foremost authority on anything in this world, especially not games, but that's like going to an amusement park and you can only visit 70% of the amusement park and do all the rides. And all the rides you really want to ride, you can't afford to because you don't have no more cash. <laughs> I know it probably isn't the best idea for an example, but I'm sure you get the point. But somehow, by some chance, you don't, I could present another view or viewpoints to help you out. Start by harkening back to the days before digital downloads and online patching, during what I like to think of as the golden age of gaming. Even just a matter of years ago, demo discs would be attached in the backs of certain magazines. Physical discs were the primary medium, and games were either complete and polished on launch day, or they failed. Since that time has faded away, for some reason, the gaming industry has become the only digital entertainment genre that blatantly sells unfinished and incomplete products. Apply this same sort of scenario to any other industry, and it starts to become glaringly obvious, especially digital industries. Imagine watching a Marvel movie, but halfway through, the special effects stop working. And when some audience members start to express annoyance, other audience members shush them and say, the special effects will be here in a few months. You don't really expect them to be done, do you? <laughs> Pay to win and DLC advantages. Paying to win. Well, fuck competing. No, seriously. Are we really so fixated on winning that the whole having skill and get good things are actually irrelevant? What does that say to anyone who actually spent countless hours putting together walkthroughs, tips, tricks, and little known mechanics and or components that you can cultivate to enhance your status as a competitor? I can completely understand the concept of wanting everyone to play, but come on, why disregard the fans who made your game a thing? There's culture, there's tradition, there is honor in game, or well, all of those life lessons we learned playing video games rendered null and void here today. Who raised these kids? <laughs> I guess it was my generation if you want to be frank. I know people can argue winning is everything, but is it really? How can winning even be deemed worthy if no one ever lost? <laughs> it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in a simplistic aspect, but it makes sense just like if everyone was perfect, no one would be. You get it? Nah, it's okay if you don't. Paying, paying to win is a propagandized movement. And real gamers cringe at imbalances and in competitive arenas. That's why there's a ban list in Yu-Gi-Oh. That's why certain specialists and certain weapons and attachments are not allowed in official Call of Duty games. This is why certain characters in fighter games are just full on and outright not allowed to be played like Meta Knight and Smash Bros. Brawl. A community built upon the competitive nature of a har of hardcore gamers who actually paid just to play. The arcade ranks, the Atari kids. The gaming world is nothing like what it used to be. Change can be a good thing, but I guess it could be bad too. Empowering the gamer. This portion is mostly what I believe. I believe that you, as a gamer, not only as a gamer, but one who supports the industry as a whole, a piece of a puzzle that cannot be complete without you. What are video games if there's no one who wants to play them? What are video games if everyone just decided to grow up and stop playing them? This is the reality that we live in. Games exist because people want to play them. Gaming developers exist because someone has to dedicate themselves to creating a product that someone wants to play. The publisher is there to present a game to you and provide the contact from the developer to game. With the rise of independent games and studios, you can argue you don't even need a publisher nowadays. This may be true, but independent developers don't have the budget to produce the same quality and magnitude of clarity most of us have become so accustomed to. So what's your point, Professor? It's up to you to decide what you want. Gaming developers and publishers have given in to the demands of gamers. Rarely, but they have. You as gamers don't feel don't feel strong or strongly enough to want to do anything. Well, what can I do? Just stop buying DLC just because it's bad for you. Completely opinionated in that excerpt, yeah. So sue me. Suggested content versus downloadable content. I honestly don't even know why this isn't a thing. Why isn't there suggested content? Just think about it for a second. What if after the initial stages, the development stages of a game, 
why not take a poll or ask people who liked the previous installment what they would like to see in a new release or some things we can improve upon with our current game. Why is there not more transparency between gamers and developers? If there was a completely open line of direct communication such as a forum or chat room in game or online to compile and review suggestions from the ground level, boots on the ground players who supported your title developers. Why would you not want to drastically improve your odds of success by simply asking the people who play the game what they actually want to see? A dedicated community knows what they want. Or do they? Hey, the Call of Duty community. I hate the community, all right? Uh, the majority of the community. And this is why. Oh, <laughs> you probably have no idea what's going on. All right, uh, let me clear some things up for you. The like and dislike bar on the left belongs to the Call of Duty Infinite Warfare trailer. And the like and dislike bar on the right belongs to the Call of Duty World War II trailer. You understand now? Sometimes whether we like to admit it or not, we're the problem and nothing will change until we do. What took you so long?